Welcome to our Roundtable Chats. Today, we're going to be talking about how to hire and retain talent. We encourage participation from you, from the audience. We know that a lot of you are probably listening in from um, the offices that you're working from, but you know, feel free to either leave comments in the chat or the Q&A. We'll pick it up as we go along. Feel free to also share this out to all of your colleagues as well. You know, I think these type of conversations are really great when other people, when you're kind of being able to engage with other people after the fact, after you've listened to this and kind of continue the conversation either at your office or with your friends, you know, over, over drinks or dinner. So yeah, with that, let's dive right in. So today we're joined also with Sylvia and Chris from the marketing team. So maybe we can kind of just kick it off with Sylvia. I think, um, you know, from your perspective, um, I'm curious about you know, a lot of us come from architecture, that's our background, but I'm, I'm curious from your recent experiences, like what ultimately do you think are the things that people should be focusing on at firms to help to retain talent? Obviously you've made the jump recently to join Monograph, but you know, this jump could have been to just another firm also. So I'm very curious about like, what are the things that you felt uh, could be done more, uh, you know, not, not, not naming names or anything, but just like in general, what are the things that you think could be improved? Yeah, thanks for the intro, George. Um, I would say that over the summer when I was starting to, I think I'm always looking for what opportunities are out there um, to see just what intrigues me. What, um, And I think if I feel like I'm at a place in my uh, job where I'm not really being challenged or my time isn't really well spent and I'm not actually growing, you know, we do those yearly reviews. And if we're talking about the same things, two back-to-back -back reviews, like it's not a very good thing. If there's like a midway point, I think it happened during COVID, understandably. We had our mid-year halfway point review and I had nothing to talk about. I mean, I know we were in a pandemic, but then it's also like, why are we having this review? And like, everything's just expected to go on as, you know, planned where it's like, talk about your accomplishments, what you want to achieve, you know, your SMART goals. But it's like, I didn't do anything in six months that I really have much to say about. And then I think that like feels, gives you a sense of stagnation. Um, so I just wanted to see what else was out there. Also during um, you know, the shutdown and all that, everyone's just on their computers all the time working constantly. And then if your projects that you're working on aren't actually fulfilling, or if you're spending all your time, but it's on a lot of work that can, is repeated for, you know, you kind of feel like you're doing the same thing week after week. I think a lot of those feelings of what I'm experiencing wanted me to find something more worthwhile of all the time I was putting in because, like I was on the computer all hours of the night and I think monograph came around. I really appreciate it. Even though we're all fully remote, I have tons of contact points where I can work with my team collaboratively. And I really appreciated that. I'm sure we'll get into more details later. So I'll pass it off to Chris to hear some of his thoughts. Yeah, I mean, on the question of retainment. So one kind of crazy thing we've noticed, um, you know, every day, we're talking with a lot of principals every day in the, in the market, uh, all across the U S in the five to 30 range. And a lot of the time we'll ask this question, what, where do you see the most room for improvement in the way that you're managing your projects? And a funny answer that we see a lot is, uh, hiring people or getting better talent, staffing, those kinds of things. At the same time, um, this isn't the only reason why people uh, move into monograph as a firm, but we've also noticed that when firms are hiring or have hired or in a hiring mode, they tend to move into monograph too. So there's two kind of interesting things around hiring that we're seeing at monograph. Um, I'll also add another thing. So as I've been at, as I've been working as a team lead, uh, on the sales side in the past couple of months, um, and I've been just going as much as I can into team dynamics, how to create more cohesion. I have really reflected on the interviews that we've had George, myself, and Sylvia with firm leaders across the country. And there are two things that show up a lot. Uh, it's one is that communication is like the number one most important thing to um, do right. And two is recognizing that we are in a people business. Um, that what we do is we channel 
talent. We channel the skills, the services of high skilled um, professionals. And, um, and with, when you combine all those things, it's kind of really interesting to me uh, when I think about the, the, mo the, the kind of like challenging work conditions that people have. Um, so around the question of talent and lots of principals struggling to find good talent, supposedly, or activate good talent, supposedly. Um, what I've noticed in synthesizing, like in my own team dynamics is I've noticed that tiny, tiny, tiny details, things that seem superfluous, like extra, like not essential, can be the difference in activating team cohesion. And I've been, I've been reading this great book I just finished called The Culture Code, which is all about this. And um, I was just talking to an engineer on our team who comes from architecture just before this. And, you know, we don't work together normally, but this is like a cool thing that Monograph does where we set up a, a, a chat every, every two weeks or every week with someone just randomly in the firm, in the company. And so we were, we were jamming on this idea about like, you know, something I've noticed, I don't know if this is completely true, but something I have noticed in our accounts in Monograph is that some of the most active companies in Monograph, they have taken the time to add a profile photo for each of their team members. And that is so unnecessary. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to do that to make Monograph work. But I noticed that. I noticed that it's kind of weird. Why, you know, why is, why is there seem to be a correlation? I haven't totally verified in the data, but what I've seen anecdotally in my own experience is that the firms that tend to do this, they seem to also be really active in Monograph. And now that I've been leading this team really focused on team dynamics, I now see that those are the kinds of details that activate a team, that create a difference in the, dyna the dynamics of a team. So anyways, that, I want to kind of add that. Oh, there's a couple of different contexts there, but um, I'm sure you've seen something like this, George, in how you've been leading teams. Um, and because, you know, you've been a major inspiration for me and how I've been on your team and the way that you've activated the team. And I've been trying to put it into practice. So I'm curious what you have to say about this whole idea about uh, retaining, activating the team, especially the things that a lot of people would maybe think is unnecessary. Yeah, I mean, I, kind of a broken record maybe on some of these things about just like how you think about your team. Um, you know, you hire people, obviously people come in with different skill sets. You know, not everybody um, is hyper, is really experienced. And I think actually the most competitive companies are those that are able to take very inexperienced people and turn them into amazing people, right? I mean, that's a huge, like, that's an asymmetrical advantage because there's just always going to be a lot of people there with a lot of experience. And if you're a small firm, you know, obviously you're, you're trying to make a name for yourself. You might not be able to like uh, bring in the kind of salary sometimes that other companies might be able to bring. So you have to, you have to provide something other incentives and that's a lot through empowerment. Like how do you empower people to run, to just run, uh, I think is another, another key thing that, you know, it's very kind of top of mind as a leader. You have to figure out, how do you find the right people that feel like they're highly self-motivated to some extent? Obviously, it's very difficult. Like if in the book, um, High Output Management, which I sometimes talk about, they have a graph that basically talks about there's only two things you can do with people. Either you can train them or motivate them. So in other words, like if you're highly skilled, if, if you have an employee that's highly skilled, the only thing you can do is focus on motivation. What motivates them? What keeps them engaged? Things like that. If you have a person that is highly motivated, but not skilled, all you can do is train them. And so even like using those frameworks to think about how do you focus attention on people or like, what do you want to, um, you know, how do you want to engage with them at an individual level is important. Uh, and that leads to retention or to retaining them, right? Um, because if you have highly skilled people, but you have yet, you're not, you're overlooking completely the motivation, which I think Sylvia was talking about, right? highly skilled, 10 years of experience, right? Um, or more, Sylvia working. And like, you know, you'd say like you are in the market right now, you are in high demand. There's a lot of firms that are looking for experienced architects at, um, at 10 years and above, but the motivation was lacking, 
right? I, I, you, you hit a wall where like you were just not motivated in the work that you do. So as a hiring manager, you need to be in tune with your team. And this is why we also argue that like annual reviews are broken. You shouldn't be doing them. You should be doing what we do here at Monograph, which is either a bi-weekly or sort of fortnight uh, one-on-one or a monthly one-on-one or even a quarterly one-on-one would be great with a direct manager or at least a people advocate or somebody that is in your corner, not a mentor necessarily, right? Because mentors are typically unstructured relationships that, you know, firms try to curate, but they're, they kind of often fail. It's more of like a direct manager who's actually in like looking f- out for you, right? Um, so it's about the cadence of that motivation too and the cadence of that training. You can't just leave up some of these things to chance. Like it actually involves a lot of um, getting the weeds because the highest leverage thing you can do as a, as a leader when you have a team is enable your team to run. Give them the opening to be able to lead. Even if they're a junior designer, figure out what they're really good at and give them ownership on that. Let them know, hey, you're really good at, and we don't want to pigeonhole you, but we know you're very good at rendering, right? And what we want, to, what we want you to do is help everyone else be good at rendering, right? I don't want you to be the only renderer on the team. I want everybody to be skilled or like figure out the workflow or like help them figure out what tools we need to bring in so that everyone can just press a button and gets a high quality rendered output where you just need to come in and edit. Like this is how you have to think to enable people to feel like they're showing up and doing the best work. If you just think about like, hey, I need you to jump in on this, uh, you know, you're just going to be doing um, door schedules on this project and that's all you do, you're going to lose that person over time. Like you need to figure out how to help design their career path also so they have variability, so they have like, or they're focused on optimizing these things to enable the entire business. Once you give people that ability to feel like they're actually contributing to the entire company, you change behavior, you change motivation, you change how people show up to work. If you just look at it as like, I need to crank this project out and I'm just going to put people on this project and whatever, you're, you know, it's a very, it's just short-term way of thinking. And it doesn't really matter how busy you think you are as a firm owner. Like you have nothing without your team. So like, it doesn't like you can, you know, there's a lot of times where like firm owners can complain about the, the lack of resources that they might have or the lack of time or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's your business. And like, you need to figure out how to remove the things that you're not good at, bring on people that are really great at the things that you're not good at so that you can focus on ensuring that the entire business is moving forward and retaining talent is the most critical thing you can do. Um, because I think the other part of this that people sort of, you know, coming from New York, um, or at least having gone to school in New York and all the firms that are there, like the, like there is, you know, you hear a lot of the stories about sort of like churning and burning employees that work in very interesting companies. But the problem with that mentality is that those, a lot of times they're not thinking about the repercussions of what that means from team morale perspective, you know, letting go of really talented people, whether they leave on their own or whatever impacts does have psychological impact on everyone else's work. They get nervous. They start to feel like, why am I not leaving? You know, like these things are may, may seem imperceptible, but they matter. And then if you just want, if you're more like financially focused as a firm leader, then just think about the fact that it takes about six months to find another person. Six months. It took you six months to find somebody. It took you about six months to train them to be fully onboarded to your company on average. And so think about that, right? Just think about all the costs that you've embedded into finding somebody only for them to leave 12 months later. How does that make any financial sense, right? I think you need to really focus on this. Uh, and, and by you, I mean the industry at large, right? Um, on like how to solve this problem. And sometimes, yeah, it could be benefits help. Having a great benefits package could help with some of this. But even then, you know, like, Studies show time and time again, there's only a certain amount of, uh, there's like that, that kind of like financial cushion that people need in which they don't have to think about finances anymore. 
where then like getting motivation, I think it's Daniel, uh, Daniel Pink that talks about this in Drive, where at some point motivation has to come from something else, has to come from like intrinsic motivation. And so all these things are part of like how you need the calculus that you need to have in your head as to how to build a great team. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm ranting a little bit, but um, I think all these things together, you know, um, is what leads to teams that want to keep working with you. Because, you know, I know there's a lot of conversations around unions and at the end of the day, right now, today, very much work is at will. And those employees have an equal right to leave. And so it's at this point right now, it's very much, you know, I think firm owners need to recognize what's happening and really uh, attuned to that, be attuned to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, our career fair that we're hosting at Section Cut, completely virtual. So we're asking all of our registrants, are they looking for opportunities or are they interested in hiring? And we have almost just as many people who are interested in hiring as people that are looking. So it's very much like you can see that you don't have to stay at a place that doesn't work for you. I think um, architecture has a really bad rep for being very unkind to their workers. We don't get paid as much for the hours we work and it's very long hours for very like highly skilled work that doesn't pay for it. And that's how long can people really sustain that? And why would we want to, especially like in the midst of a global pandemic? So I think you have to firms have to change the mentality that employees are expendable. I feel that's like very common um, way that people uh, run their firms that like, oh, if this person leaves, I'll just find someone else to take their role. Like we can move on without them. But if that's how you treat your workers, like how does that extend to all the things that you do? Like Monograph has these values that I think keep showing up, like people first do the uh, right thing which is usually do the hard thing and I feel like I say that to myself sometimes like oh I could do a quick fix here and like I could just move on with it but I was like well I know like the way that we set up everything so I want to like keep to that and I think those are how we work as architects like you can do things messy or you can follow your like design principles you can follow your like project um out, like structure like this these are how you run projects well and it the payoff is um like, it keeps like working for you like so you should treat your company the same way like value your employees give them the tools they need to succeed and they won't leave you for better opportunities I would say everyone that I thought was quite talented at my previous job I believe is now in a new firm or position or role and I'm not surprised at all they were very talented what they were doing they're very passionate putting so much of their time and effort that was the part that kind of killed me like I felt that firms want to use your unbillable hours as a way to promote how great their firm is, but also want you to do it on top of your projects that you do 40 hours a week. It happens all the time. And like, those are the parts that like people, why people like to be at firms, those things that are not part of their projects um, that create the rest of their culture. And you can't rely on people to do this after their projects that they're working more than 40 hours a week on. So that's my rant, I guess. Oof, just like mic drop on that. I mean, th just to quickly follow up, I feel like um, there's a piece of what you're talking about too, where I feel like, you know, if, if you're in the audience and you're a firm runner, I, I, could, I could hear you potentially thinking out loud of like, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when we talk about salaries, when we talk about some of these things, it's predicated on like the work that we can bring in. Um, so how do you solve for that? And I'm curious, like Chris, like, what your take would be on that if you heard that from somebody? Yeah, um, I mean, one one thing I want to remind everybody, you know, if, if you're a firm owner um, in the room or listening to this, <clears throat> uh, well, if, if you're in the monograph universe, you're probably doing something right. Uh, you're probably you're probably trying to learn. You're probably think very competitively. How how am I going to make a great practice? Um, and if you're in this room and you are not a firm owner, you're probably going to be a firm owner in the future. You probably have this, you have an ambition for, uh, you're already thinking, what would I do if I was uh, building a practice, either a brand new one or as a new partner to uh, a practice that wants to build longevity. Um, it's totally possible to do it both ways. You can start from scratch 
or you can expand um, an existing organization. And I got to tell you, there are some firms out there that are doing it right. <laughs> um, my favorite thing to see in new firms that join into Minecraft are the firms where the principals want to create a new layer of, organ of, of, of leadership in the practice between the principals and the project architects. And the usual way that they do this, I've, see, I've, I've talked to so many people who do this. It's, it's like my most exciting story. It's not just one story, but it's like I see it a lot. They either take a project architect lead um, who is the most experienced or has the like has expressed and has demonstrated the most knack for thinking systematically about the work. And they will the principal will delegate oversight of the practice operations as a way of lifting this project architect into this new strata. And it is so exciting because a lot of the time we'll have firms that are like a transparency based firm already. They just look, are looking for the right platform to help um, the rest of the organization see what's going on without everybody having to have access to that Excel file or to learn how to use like a really technical tool, you know, like some of the other platforms that are kind of in our vicinity. Um, Another example variant on this is, is not just one person elevated, but two or three people from different functions that an office manager so, or plus that project architect or someone who's currently in business development at first, because that was the place where the business side of things was really important. But then you realize, oh, this is a person who has a real sense for the whole business side. Executive assistants. People who used to be like an executive assistant to one of the principals, their view of the organization is much more than just that. You know what I mean? So those are the kinds of people that are being empowered in firms. I love seeing that. It's so cool. <laughs> and, and there are lots of firms hiring right now. So don't be stuck. Please don't suffer in uh, the seat that you're in. If you're unhappy, there is a huge market out there so many firms like just way more than you would think and we're looking at this i'm looking at this all the time how many there are it doesn't end it's kind of crazy how many there are there are so many people in your shoes there are a lot of organizations out there talked to someone yesterday who has a unique organizational structure 15 employees that grew by five in the past two or three years they have a very unique way of thinking almost every person in that in that company is a co-owner in different ways. They're starting very early and rebuilding a sustaining practice. Top heavy, lots of architecture, architects, like licensed architects are in this group. They're going through their own challenges, you know, how do they staff, how do they, how do they staff? You know, they have like higher billable employees that um, they're trying to figure out like, do they double in size basically to distribute that, um, some of that workload to uh, the next generation of designers and try to disseminate the knowledge that a lot of that like kind of top heavy management has. There's so many interesting questions that firms are trying to figure out. Um, but yeah, that's the way I, I, I love that story. <laughs> there are people like from my, from, from college, someone who graduated after me, younger than me. Um, he's too young to be in a leadership position like normally and we've seen this person he he's been elevated along with the office admin who's been there for um for a longer period of time and they're forming this new unit to i mean it's so cool it is really cool there are a lot of great firms out there and you're going to be able to find some of them in this job fair and if you're if you're this kind of firm if you are a firm leader in this kind of firm, you got to get yourself in the job fair. Um, Cause you're probably hiring. You're probably doing something right. You're probably looking for more people. There might be even some people in this room who you should be hiring right now. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's a, a, some of the components that you touched upon is like, well, if you're a firm owner, there's a couple of solutions that you might have. One is like operations. Like how do you, 
How do you focus some of the, those responsibilities within the team today to help streamline potentially the inefficiencies that could lead to it being okay to have a certain amount of like client pipeline. The other is just like, how do you expand client pipeline in general? Having a dedicated business development person, if you're not very good at you know, bringing in work, then you should start to build out more of that because your whole, whole lifeblood of the business is predicated upon being able to bring in pipeline. We do have uh, one, one uh, question here. Uh, we're a small firm, one principal, two contract employees and are looking to grow mm -hmm. our contract employee base plus one or two more with one of those people being a PM type person so that I as a principal can do more leadership work and step away from the details um, of projects, et cetera. Any suggestions on how we can take this step to grow? Um, so you have two contract employees. I think just off the top of my head, I think one of the first things to understand is basically like who like outlining the roles and responsibilities of that PM type person and understanding like, you know, so what are all the things that you want this person to do and kind of be very detailed and understand systematically what it is for yourself? Because you kind of want to understand, first of all, like what is the scope of work that this person's going to be doing? And then have a really clear plan for yourself as to like, what are the next things that you're going to be doing once you find this person? So just being able to step back and really map that out so that you have a really clear plan for yourself as to like, when you say like, um, stepping away from the details of the, of the projects, what does that handoff look like? So if this person's owning the projects themselves, how are you interfacing with that person? Are you more of an editor or are you more of like in the weeds? Also, I think it's the mental preparation of knowing that you won't be in the weeds anymore. And so as part of your interviewing process, when you're looking for this candidate, really trying to understand like what's the right profile of that person such that you potentially don't have to worry on the details anymore. Um, Second step is just understanding what does the market look like in terms of salaries for that role so that you have very clear expectations as to what that, you know, if, if this is a challenge for the business, can you pay someone at market rate or above market rate in order to ensure the peace of mind for yourself of not having to be in the weeds anymore? Um, I think those, that's kind of like a really first step to understand. It's like what we try to do here is we try to have almost like playbooks for the work that we're doing such that we understand how to hand it off to someone else if necessary. And I think that kind of prep work is very important for yourself. And then, you know, cause if, if you do the opposite, if you just kind of like find somebody, oh, you're a PM, you have some PM experience, you might scope out the work to just be about managing a project. And that might not ultimately be what you're looking for. You might be looking for somebody that actually can do a lot more than just PMing a project. Um, not to say that just PM in a part of this is its own thing, but like you might actually be looking for a more operationally minded person so that you can focus on other things, right? You probably want to focus, and I'm just reading into what the very short paragraph here, but you probably want to focus on like bringing in work versus the operational component. We see this very often with a lot of firms, especially those that actually do have two partners. Um, best approach is often that someone's focused on being the 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 managing director of the firm focused on operations versus the other person that's focused on business development and bringing in work. If that's kind of where you're headed, then you really need to look for someone that has the ability to stretch into a managing director role and is operationally inclined to think about not how to just manage contract employees, but also how to grow the firm. And so that has to kind of factor into how you're thinking about compensation, how to bring that person in. If there are more junior, then you really have to find, you know, uh, sort of diamond in the rough on that front to like stretch into a role. Um, but that's kind of my two cents on that front. Um, what that what that could look like. Cool. It looks like it's, uh, yeah, the mindset and vision casting for the ideal version. Yes. It's kind of like, where do you want to be in five years? Thinking even about the team as, as that, as that will kind of emerge is helpful for you to think about what are the roles and responsibilities that person needs to have in order for you to um, find them, right? Because people are looking and stuff like that, but I think it's like really defining that job description to find the right people so that you're not inundated also with like, um, you know, more work for you because it will review a lot of uh, resumes. 
Um, I will, I'll, that, I'll also add to um, that, um, just as a final note to add on to that, George, um, there is not just one way to do this. Uh, I've definitely heard one idea, hire a more senior architect than you might've thought. Two, hire a kind of office studio manager, admin like person, like George mentioned. Some people think you don't do that until you're 30 people, 15 people. I've definitely talked to firms. That was their first hire. Um, also think about what you're going to be able to, what you're going to be operationalizing about yourself, what you're going to be doing all the time, all the time. Is it business development? Are you gearing up for what that would look like for yourself to spend way more time on business development than you've ever spent? Um, is that where you want to go? If not, then maybe you need to think about how this person is going to help you do business development at scale through way more differentiated marketing. So maybe that's the right partner to bring on. Maybe you're really dedicated to design. So think a little bit about what you're going to operationalize about yourself and are you really committed to doing the work it takes if not you might want to find someone who can help you do that part so you can continue actually doing the thing that you're good at i know we're at time too but i really want to add that it's it's so important to find to wait out until you find the person that fits the your team really well because there's no point in hiring someone that's going to leave after a month or that's like such a rough fit that everyone's like really like hard it's hard to work with them because that is just making the situation worse in some cases um george i don't know if you have anything to say to this but i feel like you took some time to hire for the roles that we had open in our department and like it seemed like you were looking for the right person like even when you were talking about chris during his one year you're like people could do the job but you want to find like i think it's like that's something more that they can bring to the team and i mean i love the people we work with here at monograph so it's one of the best places i've worked i feel like that's even more important than the work we do on some days yeah it's tough it's not easy right i mean like it means you have to wait longer. You have to kind of really follow your intuition sometimes about what the right person might look like for the role, um, or just like you know, what 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 qualities are they bringing in, attitude perspective, mindset perspective, and how do they uh, multiply the work of the the rest of the team in some capacity? And uh, you know, I think on top of that, also thinking about diversity and inclusion is part of like the way you're thinking about hiring is also really critical. So sometimes it really just takes a long time because you need to account for that as well and just make sure that it's not a, if it's a pipeline problem or, you know, in the, in the case of diversity inclusion and you're just not uh, finding the right candidates to that, it's also going out and reaching out potentially and trying to find people from that are working at other firms and kind of like, you know, uh, bring them and recruit them into the into the company. Um, but yeah, it's it's just like, all that time, that's why I said six, takes about six months to find that right person. You should be factoring that along with your search. Um, but it's just being very intentional at the very beginning about what are the qualities of that role and resp the responsibilities that are going to make the difference. Um, cool. Well, with that, um, we are over time, but thanks everyone for joining us. I really appreciate, uh, thanks for uh, that comment, Matt, and appreciate um, the conversation. See you next week. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye. See ya. Thank you, everybody. Bye.